Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. I've got noon here uh, on the East Coast uh, as we're kicking off Up to Speed today. Today, we've got a very special edition of Up to Speed Live where uh, Hans will lead a panel discussion on race. Uh, joining him today is Clarence Otis Jr., who is the lead director for our Verizon Board of Directors, also the former chairman and CEO of Darden Restaurants Incorporated, Wendy Chisetta, who leads uh, global uh, commercial operations as part of the Verizon Business Group, Krista Bourne, who leads our consumer sales and operation for the Verizon Consumer Group, uh, Ranjan Wee, who is the head, uh, global head of diversity of inclusion at Verizon Media, and our chief of human resources, Christy Pambianchi. Uh, so without further ado, Hans, over to you, please. Thank you, Jeremy, and uh, hi, all V-teamers and everyone out there. Uh, we are on our week 12 on uh, Up to Speed Live, uh, and uh, uh, it's been uh, uh, encouraging to see how many of the V-teamers joining us for this conversation every day. And yesterday we had our all-time high, and I, I thank all the employees for joining. We had uh, in total almost 70,000 of you joining yesterday in our conversation we had, uh, which was so important uh, around the racism and where we stand as a company and how unified we stand for diversity. And I said in my speech yesterday, which I have to agree it was hard to deliver uh, uh, in the times when you feel sadness and frustration um, that uh, we're here to uh, have an open discussion and listening and learning and see what we can do more as a corporation. And, and uh, we pivoted and uh, we got a fantastic group of people that are going to talk to here and uh, hear about how they feel about this. And, and what we can do. And, and just a short couple of introductions. I, I know that Jeremy talked about Clarence Otis then. He's the lead director of our board. That means that he is the closest uh, uh, as I can get to someone in the board. And he's guiding me in many things. And he is a, a great leader. He's been a CEO of Darling Group before. And, uh, uh, having a very close relationship with him, and I think that he is representing the board and seeing what we're doing, and but also representing himself and his background. Wendy Tassetta, of course, uh, running one of the largest operations for a, a telecom business group, or a business group uh, over 30 billion in revenue. Wendy is running that with all the challenges in operation have in these times, and I, I'm grateful to have her on the call. Krista Bourne, probably running one of the largest. Uh, consumer sales and operations in the world uh, with all our stores and operations um, and uh, there's no other telecom operator had bigger consumer business than us and Krista is running that every day with the challenge that comes with that and I'm grateful for that. Uh, we also have Ram Jan Louis which is running our diversity an inclusion program in Verizon Media Group, which is so important uh, for us. Uh, and ultimately, we have our uh, chief human resource head, Christy Pamjanki, that is leading all our work. And, and, and as I said, we, we, we want to have a conversation about it. And conversation has been ongoing. Yesterday evening, our uh, employee resource group, Bolt, had a, uh, an open conversation with thousands of, of V-teamers joining. Uh, and I, I'm, 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 I'm pleased to see that this is happening across the company right now. So uh, let me let me opening this dialogue and, and, and start talking to Wendy. Wendy, uh, last week we we witnessed the, the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, uh, which has led to global protests. Um, what was your reactions uh, on how you, and how are you handling? what is happening right now, and, and what are you doing to deal with it, Wendy? So, Hans, first, let me, uh, let me start with thank you. I think in my 20-year career at Verizon, there's been a lot of reasons to be proud. I have seen us respond to crisis moments. Um, I have seen us confront things we didn't know how we would get through. But I have never been more proud of our leadership yesterday and I've never been more proud of our commitment. And I say that as an employee, I say that as a leader, I say that as a black female, because while many companies issued great statements over the weekend, I saw for so many, 
willing to be vulnerable about how it feels and willing to put our pocket behind the commitment. Um, so I would just say for the thousands of messages we saw, I would speak for so many to say thank you for that. It makes me feel good about where I choose to have my career. Um, and it makes me feel good about the role we can play in the future. What I would tell you about last week is I have spent a lot of time thinking about this. I don't think we all came to last Sunday at the same place in the journey. I think by the time I saw the video Monday morning, I had already been angry. I had watched the video from Central Park with Christian Cooper on Sunday night. I had had that conversation with friends around why, why and express Sophie in a moment when she knew she was wrong. I had watched us judge Christian Cooper overnight to see whether or not she had cause to feel fear. And I woke up Monday morning to find that it was going to get worse and a lot more worse. I think the other thing that was true was that it has been a long couple of months. You know, I am, I grew up in the Bronx. I'm first generation American. And the Bronx has the highest rate of COVID infections and COVID deaths per 100,000 people. I have attended more Zoom funerals in the last few months than I ever want to talk about. The unemployment rate has impacted my community in such significant ways. And it has been a hard few months as we've tried to lead through this as leaders. So I think we all came to Monday morning at a different place on the journey. And then days, what was different for some of us, and I can speak for myself, is that it was on my mind all the time. It didn't start for me Thursday night when we saw the national riots. I was watching and I was waiting and I was hoping that we would see action taken faster, that this time would be different, that we had learned how important communication was going to be, giving confidence that it would be objective was going to be, and that we would see leadership in the moment. And throughout that week, things got worse. And what then followed is probably the thing that I hear most of my friends talking about, which was the fear. The fear of what was gonna happen next, the fear that it could happen to one of my friends, to a child that I know, the fear that despite all of our best intentions, despite cameras, it was far too Oh, your question, your last question was, what, do I, what am I doing? I am, I'm educating myself. I'm spending time reading beyond the headlines. I'm reaching out to my friends and my family. And when I ask them how they're doing, I'm not expecting them to say they're doing okay. I am deciding how much news I can consume. Some nights, Saturday night, way too much. I had to hit refresh on Sunday morning. And then I am deciding how to use my voice at the table. I am deciding how I can, as a leader, how I can, as an employee, help the other people who are scared right now. Um, and I'm deciding what actions I will take different this time as we go forward. Because what I know is that what we've done to this point was not enough to stop what happened. And I am not willing to accept that we are victims. And I am not willing to accept that we don't have in front of us. So I'm part of the conversation. I'm part of hoping that there will be change, but I'm also going to get more involved because I believe that this next generation does not, that should not have the same fears that so many of us have had our entire time growing up. So that's where I'm at. It's been a tough week. Thank you, Wendy. And, uh... Thank you for all the work you're doing and how you stand up. And uh, that comment about reaching out to friends in times like this becomes even more important. And I, I thank you for the work you're doing as an individual, as an V-teamer. And, uh, and I understand uh, how tough it can be and how to get through all of this. And, and, and uh, speaking about that fear that 
uh, that uh, one can feel, you know. Uh, so Clarence, I want to come to you here, and, and for, because many feel that fear and um, uh, the frustration and the outrage and the helplessness uh, uh, right now. And in your opinion, what do you think these incidents continue? Why do you think these incidents continue at such a persistent rate uh, with your experience? Well, thank you, Hans. Again, I uh, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be with you and with the, uh, the V-teamers this afternoon. Um, I think uh, it has persisted. I mean, first of all, that's uh, undeniable. I grew up in Los Angeles, and I grew up in Watts in Los Angeles. And the Watts riot uh, of 1965 occurred when I lived in the community, and that was triggered by an instance of police brutality. And as we grew up, the biggest dominant, most dominant thing in our lives as black men was law enforcement and this sort of war between the community and law enforcement. And that has continued. It has not changed. It's not always been visible. Uh, sometimes it gets visible in incidents uh, that break out like the riots of 65 or in L.A., the Rodney King riots after the video there. It gets more visible uh, over the last decade or so with uh, the pervasiveness of cell phones and, and camera phones, basically. And so we see more and more of it. But I know having grown up in a challenging inner city environment that in the inner city, this is a day-to-day -day reality. It's been a day-to-day -day reality for decades. And so it has persisted. And I think the reason why it's persisted is too many people turn the other way. Too many people sort of know it goes on, but they don't really hold uh, law enforcement accountable. I mean, we are quick to hold much of the government accountable, public works departments, school districts. But we buy into this narrative that, well, law enforcement's a dangerous job. It's a tough job, so we can't second guess. And that's nonsense. It's a public sa safety agency. Uh, it should be transparent about its operations, transparent about the numbers behind the arrests, uh, the demographic breakdowns on stops and arrests and all those things be transparent about how they're spending money, to be transparent about how they're managing their own human resources. And we don't bring that level of accountability. And again, we fall back on this notion that it's a dangerous job. We don't allow military, when we go outside this country, to fall back on that excuse. The fact that it's a dangerous job does not mean that they can engage in war crimes. And when they do, there's typically fairly significant accountability. But that has not been the case domestically. And that's something that needs to change. Okay, Clarence, thank you very much for sharing your experience and what you have been seeing over the years. Uh, of course, it's uh, a persistent rate of, of these type of things we have seen. Uh, let, let me go to Krista Bourne. And, and Krista, you... you uh, oh. Uh, have, of course, tough times uh, right now with the COVID uh, opening and part of the store, seeing that we have uh, our employees safe and healthy in both the pandemic and the, the riots we have seen. But uh, let me ask you a little bit of a different question. Uh, many black households around the country refer to having the talk uh, with their children. What does it mean and what have you said to your children? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Hans. And, uh, you know, I want to echo what, what uh, Wendy mentioned in the beginning. I, um, I feel incredibly proud at the actions we've taken and the example that you've set, not just for us as a leadership team, but for corporate communities everywhere. I think it's important for all of us to acknowledge what we do and what we do not know about this topic. And that's going to be the only way these conversations matter. The conversation in, in a household with African-American families where they have the talk has a few different flavors to it, but each flavor 
is a talk about caution, to talk about what's different with no real reason for that difference to exist. That's a good reason. In my household, I raised uh, our children with my husband, and the conversation we've had with them is you have um, one thing to do. There are five words. You need to live to tell your story. Those are not words you want to say to your child as a parent just because they're going to go to the movies and do what kids do. You don't want to have to ground your children on what it means to respect authority, but at the same time, understand that even authority should be held to a standard. And it's really scary when you have to pick up the phone and remind your kids now grown, living on their own, that times are tense and their childhood lessons, unfortunately, still apply. I had to call my son and just make sure he was aware that you need to be very cautious. The way that you move, the way that you navigate, I need you to live to tell your story. I need you to be a part of this environment that we're creating as a family, as a community, because you deserve to. I need you to feel safe when you walk out of the home. But I can't guarantee that because the rules are different for you. What's tolerated is different for you. And explaining to my daughter, who wants to build a career in, in um, the space of defending rights of others and, and, and having a purpose, she struggles with the idea that we are presumed guilty before anything, when you should be presumed innocent, and then you have to be proven guilty. That doesn't feel that way in our community, and that's part of the talk. And the, the other thing is you're, you're left just wondering when is enough enough? And I think to Clarence's point, for, for all of our V-teamers watching, I just want to remind everyone that, again, while this might be new to so many because of social media and imagery, it is the life that generations of African Americans and Black Americans have had to live and conversations they haven't felt comfortable having. And they sit in the room with you, they sit in the meetings, they're at the table, your experience might not be their experience, but this moment that we have to have that conversation is so incredibly powerful because it compounds for our employees, compounds for us as leaders. And at the end of the day, our culture is better than that. So thank you, Hans, for supporting this and for giving it its proper platform. And I applaud all the V-teamers who are willing to listen. And for those like me that are using our voice, as Wendy said, differently than maybe we've used it before, more directly. I thank you for the opportunity and I appreciate the time. Uh, uh, thank you, Krista. Thank you for sharing uh, how to talk to us. Uh, <clears throat> as I said yesterday, I don't have that life experience, but I appreciate to hearing it. Um, let me continue, Ram. Uh, Ram, uh, you're the global head for diversity and inclusion at Verizon Media. You're a black man uh, living in the United States. What do you want your audience watching to know about your experience? What impact have these incidents ha had on you? Thank you, Hans. Uh, I definitely have to uh, echo the sentiments from Wendy and Krista. Uh, the talk that you did yesterday and the acknowledgement of the murder of George Floyd, that goes a long way. And it goes a long way because, as you mentioned, as a black man in America, in the United States, we are viewed as less than. We are viewed as inferior. We are viewed that our life is not as valuable as anybody else. And by acknowledging it, by bringing it up, by talking about the conversation, what you're saying is that you see me and that you see us. And that's a very important message that we need to take. It's a difficult topic, it's a difficult conversation. And I know it's hard for people to, to know what to say. When you find that it's challenging, you don't know what to say, then you say that but you bring it up and you acknowledge it. The reality is, if that had taken place to an animal, 
if a police officer was on videotape with his knee on the neck of a dog for nine minutes, we know that he would have been arrested that night. That didn't happen in this circumstance. We have to raise our children and our kids in this environment. I walked in to this news story. It was playing on the TV screen and my son saw it and I couldn't gauge how I reacted and how I respond. I saw it and immediately I said, oh my God. And then immediately he tuned into it and he's like, what's going on? What is that? And I had to, I had to process it at the same time as explaining to him, well, Sometimes people don't do what it is that they're supposed to do. They don't behave in a way that they should behave. And he's like, but why is he doing that? Well, he's doing something that he should. I had to try to explain to him. And despite how I explained it to him, he still wanted to know why. He couldn't understand. I can't get my son to kill an insect. He, he can't even imagine why a human being would do that to another human being. But that's the issue. That's the point. If we are not being viewed as humans, if we're not being viewed as whole people with souls, these things happen and they will continue to happen. I started off my career working on the diversity recruitment campaign for the NYPD. This was during a time that the NYPD was going through a lot of scrutiny for uh, the shooting of Amadou Diallo, a West African immigrant who was shot 41 times. He was shot 41 times but they fired at him significantly more. They were also being criticized about Abner Louima, a Haitian man that was sexually assaulted by a plunger while he was in police custody. I am Haitian American. Growing up in Brooklyn, New York, I was the victim of being bullied, of discrimination, of people poking and making fun of us. And the reason why, again, being viewed as less than, being viewed as other. What we need to do and what we've started to do is, it's three parts. It's empathy. How do we have the conversations to really make sure that we could talk about this and we have the language? And we've had over 4,000 employees participate between our ERGs, our employees, and on the Verizon side as well. And that's the first part, advocacy. Uh, we've gone a long way in terms of the donation, and we understand that that is just a start. Uh, we have to be very prescriptive on how we want that donation to be used by the organizations, how we're going to partner with them to really make sure that we continue and we move forward with that. The third piece is action. What are we going to do? The reality is we know that everything that takes place, we, we want to have a workforce reflective of the communities that we serve. Everything that takes place outside our organization, there's elements within our organization. And we're doing things to address that. We have unconscious bias training. But we have to understand there's unconscious bias and there's conscious bias. When we talk about the murder of George Floyd, when we talk about Ahmaud Arbery, when we talk about Breonna Taylor, there's nothing unconscious about that. But when you look at what's going on on the unconscious level and the conscious level, we also have to take a look at what is it that we're doing? We have to start with the man in the mirror. What are things that we can do here at our organization? How can we make sure that we become the organization that has a North Star where we are the number one employer of choice for African-Americans, where we know that we can have stronger representation of African-Americans in senior level roles. We can do that. We can take those steps and make it happen. So again, it's pulling together empathy, the advocacy, and actually taking the necessary action. Thank you, Rama. Extremely good. Uh ideas on how we take this forward about both how we talk to each other and how we see that our money is directed in the, in the right way and, and the actions. I, I want to come back to both Ram and, and, and Krista before I, I go to Christy. And, and uh, I mean, I, I start with Christy, I mean, uh, talking about our employees as well. I mean, the number one priority in this pandemic and in this situation has been the health and safety of our employees. And, and I just want to hear from Krista a, a little bit how we see now our stores, what's happening there for our employees. Uh, and then I would like to ask Ram uh, later on about our uh, uh, journalist that's uh, out and covering uh, what's happening out in the field today, how we secure their uh, sec uh, safety and health. So, Krista, first with you. Yeah, great question for us. So in the field, as you all know, we're in the process of reopening up our stores right now. But from the civil unrest that we've seen across the country, we have had 52 of our stores experience damage. 
Uh, and uh, 30 of those stores were already closed because of COVID. So uh, there was that element. And then the balance were stores that were in operation uh, and obviously are not in operation now. And to help, you know, with the environment, we have closed another 20 stores proactively based on where we believe there could be, you know, um, unsafe environment that could get created. But the problem is that you don't know until it unfortunately occurs in some instance. So the team has been incredibly agile. If we hear from the field on the ground that there's something that's making us uncomfortable, then we will make the decision to close and err on the side of safety. We've also removed the inventory from our stores where we're not open in those environments because we would like to minimize the, the, the attraction to loot our store. Um, but most important is our, our safety of our employees. So 20 stores closed out of precaution, 52 stores damaged in all. We can repair every damage we have. We do not want to see anybody injured. Thank you, Krista, for thinking about our employees and doing their absolute right things. Uh, Ram, how about our journal journalists out in the field? Uh, same thing here. The safety of our reporters and employees remain our number one priority. We're providing journalists safety training to our reporters to help them navigate risky environments, and we're exploring other protocols to ensure we are doing everything we can to protect our journalists. Also, from an editorial perspective, we're taking the theme and the goal that what we want to do is we want to give voice to underrepresented communities. So we are making sure that we are meeting with the community. We have met with the National Associated Black Journalists, and we plan to continue to do that to really make sure we elevate these stories and that this way we can motivate community action. Thank you, Ram. Um, uh, let me now go to Christian. And uh, first of all, I'm saying that we, we, we have uh, as a clear uh, uh, value of our company that uh, diversity is making our company much stronger. It's also making the country and the world stronger when you have equality and differences of thoughts and, and representing the society. And, and that we just need to continue to drive. And, and uh, we see, see uh, discrimination for other groups in our society as well. And one thing that I think is important is, so, is to talk about how we as a company work with our uh, resource group, employee resource groups, and, and, and what we can do more here. Uh, so Christy, what are we doing? Uh, thanks for that question, Hans, and thanks for the opportunity to be on the panel today with the other speakers whose, whose stories and willingness to be out here sharing their life experiences and showing their bravery to help us advance is, is so important, and I'm honored to be on the panel with, with all of the co-panelists. I think the thing I would like to open with and what I talk to my own children about is that we can never let hatred win. And hatred rears its ugly head in so many ways, uh, and it's really incumbent upon us to come together. At a time when, if you listen to the stories that we just heard or the things that we're hearing around us, we can feel helpless, we can feel hopeless. It, be, it can be unclear how any one action each of us as an individual could take could actually make a difference. And sometimes that feeling of an insurmountable challenge uh, leaves us to take no action. And so I think today, and uh, with the dialogue we've been starting, we really feel like this is the time where we're not gonna walk away. And all the things many of us have experienced over our lifetime and the fits and starts for progress need to end. And we need to have this be the beginning of a path to sustainable change. And so in the dialogue we had last night with our bold employees, I think the first thing I took away and a few things I wanna leave people with that might be wondering what's one action I can take? How can I possibly make a difference? Um, the first thing I would offer is uh, just listen. Uh, listen and learn. Uh, I loved uh, Wendy's comment on you know, going deeper to the story behind the headlines. And that learning can take place in many ways by reading more, reaching out to members of the black and African-American community to hear their stories and understand what this is really like and how this challenge is unfolding for them and their families and their communities at this time. So I think listening is an action that any of us can take. I think second, becoming an actionable ally. So I think there's many things we can do as allies 
uh, to all of the members of the black and African community in our society. And so we need to take that listening and turn that into action. And as, as you heard Clarence's comments on, people can't just stand by. We have a responsibility to act and participate. And we'll be doing more to share with our employees how they can activate being an ally in ways that they can help drive change. Another thing is turn all this energy into action. And so you saw yesterday the donation that Hans mentioned. We found a number of the most prominent organizations that have been leading the change on this front. And we've put a $10 million donation towards their causes. And we will activate volunteer programs so employees can contribute and find ways to take their energy and their feeling of helplessness and despair and begin to take action in a way that they find fulfilling or helps them feel like they're making a difference. And in the company, we have a lot of things that we can do to make sure that we're contributing to hiring and advancing and developing rich career paths for all the employees in our company, including our black and African American employees. And finally, leading with empathy. And leading can sometimes mean that only leaders need to lead, but every individual is a leader in the life that they lead. And all of us need to take the time to lead with empathy. Uh, we're human. We are all on this planet together, and we each have one life to give. And taking the time to learn each other's story, which is such an important point that Krista made, uh, everybody has a story, and most people actually want the same thing, which is to live a fulfilling life and leave the world to their children in better hands than we each got to inherit it. And so if anyone's out there feeling helpless or they don't know what to do, anybody can do those four things. And we'll be taking steps to help bring that dialogue further in our company and help people know how they can engage. And when we look at our employee resource groups and our strategy as a company, our objective is to build the networks that move the world forward. And we think that's an exciting purpose that we want employees to feel good about. And we want to be not just uh, one of the best employers, but why not be the best employer? And the way that we're going to do that is by having an environment where everybody can thrive and all employees experience the values and the credo and the work environment the way that we've designed it, not just a select few. And so for us, inclusion is as important as a component as having a diverse workplace. We don't want to have a diverse divided workplace. We want to have a diverse inclusive and collaborative workplace. And so we have 10 employee resource groups. They have participation from any employee in the company. We have tens of thousands of people that have joined them. And they serve as a catalyst for dialogue like this discussion and others about all the issues facing the communities that participate in uh, our society that are represented here in our Verizon workforce or the communities and the customer base we serve. And it's through listening, engaging, that we make each other better, we make our company better, and we make the world we live in better. And so we can be better. This is not our finest moment. And I think as a society, and I think all of us have to find ways, even if it feels insurmountable, to take a step forward and be part of the solution. Uh, thank you, Christy. Um, uh, I share everything you said and how important this is. Um, uh, let me come back to the panelists. I mean, we have such a great team here of experience that can share what they're doing. And, and I, I want to come back a little bit what uh, Clarence said about the persistence of this. We have seen it over years. And, and, uh, and of course, a, a very normal question would be, um, how do we make this moment to a turning point? And, uh, uh, and what actions are we taking in this time? Uh, as, uh, as you said, Clarence, uh, I start with you. You said this. We have seen this over time uh, and again. And uh, how do we use this sad moment uh, to go to something better? Well, I think the, it, it all starts, and it is a pivotal moment. It's a moment that we can take huge advantage of. And I think we, in fact, are seeing the beginnings of that. When I think back to the Rodney King episode, and I think back to the trial, and when the verdict, the initial verdict came out, not guilty on all accounts, uh, everyone knew it was wrong. I was working in New York at the time, and essentially all the employers in New York allowed their people to go home early. So everyone went home early. Everyone knew that it was wrong. Uh, and everyone was puzzled, but there was no conversation about it. I think what's different here 
is that there is, in fact, a national conversation. And that's the important first step. These are issues that we've not been willing to talk about in the past. Uh, and so they faster. And I think the beginning of, of really this time is the fact that nationally we're having these conversations. And what we need to do is to make sure that these conversations then lead to action. And as so many people have said, the first action really is on the part of each of us as individuals, as members of families, as members of workplace communities. We have to be willing when we hear something that is offensive or that does not reflect uh, real fast, I'm not quite sure that I think that that's the right thing to say. So we have to begin to challenge one another. Uh, and then we have to, as citizens, begin to ask these questions. These questions are as important as any other public policy questions, perhaps more important, that come up in political dialogue. And we have to be willing to make it the case that no politician would feel comfortable standing in front of a group without addressing these kinds of issues. And so I do think it starts with conversation. Conversation begins to look uh, to result in policy changes and in behavior change. And I am encouraged that we are having these conversations. Again, uh, the King, the Rodney King verdict, stunning to everyone, but everyone was silent. Everyone went home and had their own reflections. No one talked to anyone else about it. And this, I think, is different. This feels a lot different. I'm to see that. Thank you, Clarence, uh, uh, for that call for action. And uh, uh, maybe I go to Wendy and ask you the same questions. Uh, what are we doing on this moment right now? And uh, what would be your advice? So, Hans, I would tell you I have a huge amount of passion around this, that cell phones are the great equalizer. I have the same cell phone as Beyonce. Yes, that's cool, but what's more important is that it's the same cell phone in the hands of someone making $12 an hour in this country. We have the ability to put information in the palms of people's hands. And I think what's been amazing about this moment is the reflection of how focused we are on the national elections and that we are not focused on local elections. And if you don't know who your district attorney is, if you don't know who your county executive is, if you don't know your senator, if you are not holding them accountable, we are not gonna all believe the same actions need to be taken, but we need to be educated. We need to know when elections are happening. We need to vote and then them accountable. Because the only way that this is going to change is for change to happen. And when people are talking about these issues, if you are thinking about answers and saying, well, maybe you just don't know about this or this or this, there are no answers that exist already. This requires absolute change, not just at a national level, but who, are, who is electing judges? What kinds of decisions are being made? And once people are in office, we have to hold them accountable. So I believe the same way that we have a, a divide between the haves and the haves nots from an economic standpoint, we have the same issue around education, we have the same issue around participation in voting. And we have an incredible team in this company that is engaged at all levels. And we need to leverage that to help bring knowledge so that they can participate. And I'd be remiss if I don't plug for the census. Make sure you complete your census. Make sure that your name is counted so that your representation includes you. But the only way for this to change is for us to unite and require change from the people who make the decisions. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for that, uh, and that call for action. And uh, uh, Krista, if I go to you, uh, what uh, are you taking on this moment in time? 
So for me, I think it's an opportunity to just kind of build on some of what we've done with our leadership training. We have an opportunity to take it to a very direct place. I think what we've done with empathy, what we've done with vulnerability, what we've done with leadership edge, unconscious bias, I think all of that has brought us to where we are. I think the next level is to be very direct in how we equip our leaders and our employees with the tools and the space to have a thoughtful, supportive discussion that is safe, free of judgment, and truly done with a positive intent. So we're working on a human connections training that we had piloted before now, uh, and we'll look to expand that, but we will do it with this in mind, because I think that's what people want. They want to know how to have this discussion. I, I said yesterday, and I just want to say it again, we've spent a lot of time training ourselves to guard our words and actions. It was necessary in the time we were in, and there's a lot of reason to heed that advice today. But we also now need to unlock our teams and help them understand how to have the appropriate conversation so it doesn't offend anybody and we don't isolate anybody. Everyone has an opportunity to be a part of this solution. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Thank you for everything you're doing. Uh, and your, your remarks there uh, are, are important. Uh, Ram, uh, your final comments. Thank you, Hans. Uh, so, you know, looking at it from different components. So one, if we start from the society perspective, uh, I think Clarence hit it on the nail early on in the conversation. It's a question of accountability. How do we continue to hold those responsible accountable? Uh, there's always conversations about organizations and, and uh, schools. If they are not performing, if they are not meeting their metrics, how do you defund them? How do we hold a certain degree of accountability to these local precincts and to the governments that are supposed to be governing them? How do we leverage our influence uh, with uh, PACT and, and politics to really make sure that we never take our foot off of the accelerator? How do we make sure we continue to have this conversation, even though this may not be in the news cycle anymore? As we mentioned, we all mentioned different names from Rodney King, Admiral Wima Amdou Diallo, all that's taken place over 20 years ago, but yet it still continues. And also, if we're talking about them and we're talking how we want to address it, how do we address the underlying conditions of why these things happen? The underlying condition, again, is because of that lack of empathy, that lack of being able to view that humanity across. So we need to address that with a certain degree of education and awareness. So that's the society component. From a workforce component, what are we gonna do it's always, I think it's always important to start with the man in the mirror. You know, how can we, as Christy mentioned, how can we drive a more inclusive workplace? So we drive a more inclusive workplace. We have the, the unconscious bias training. On top of that, we also rolling out conscious inclusion training. But specifically, what does conscious inclusion training look like during the time of COVID-19 and during the time of these racist acts uh, that are killing African-American people? Uh, COVID-19 are killing African-American people at a faster rate. It's as if uh, COVID's foot is on the chest of African-Americans and law enforcement is on the neck of George Floyd. How do we address that? How do we deal with that? Uh, how do we equip managers with the tool so they can have the conversations? We're also rolling out how do you have courageous conversations and we're ready to start doing that. But again, taking a look at the representation within the organization is also important. Uh, during our town hall yesterday, uh, we had an employee who actually brought up the fact that they've been, she's been with the company for 16 years. Uh, 16 years ago, she made the comment that she would like to see more African-Americans in senior leadership roles. She was told that we're working on it. We have some action plans. We're going to move forward with it. She's like 16 years later, she hasn't seen much change. Uh, we need to hold ourselves accountable. We can do better. We can no longer hide behind the excuse of, well, how do you find or where can you find qualified African-Americans? No. That it, I know where to find them. We know where to find them. We have a very great human resource department and a great talent acquisition team. We will hold ourselves accountable to really make sure that all voices are heard and we continue to give voice to the uh, unrepresented communities. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ram, and, and thank you also for the, the so important work you're doing in diversity and inclusion here as a company and, and how you contribute to this discussion and, and for making us being a stronger company and, and accountable. So thank you for that. Uh, finalizing up with Christy, your final words. Thank you, Hans, and thanks again to all of the great uh, advice and insights from the fellow uh, panelists. My uh, closing comments for all the employees on, on behalf of the VLC members as well would be a couple of, uh, you know, sort of actions we want to put into flight. First, we're going to continue the conversations that we started over the last few days. And so there'll be uh, opportunities for employees to join and participate in conversations. And even if they're uncomfortable, we want to have them so that we can move forward. Second, we know that a lot of employees are feeling undue stress and anxiety about the situation. And so we are making available EAP workshops and places where employees can go and join and share and get assistance and support for the potential strain that they're feeling personally uh, around the situation. Um, third, we're going to be continuing to promote ways in which uh, we're populating our volunteer portal with ways people can actively participate in supporting uh, you know, groups, uh, putting activities together to advance racial justice and equality. Um, fourth, we're going to be activating an ally network and putting training together for people that want to be allies. A lot of people want to do more, and they're worried about doing the wrong thing, and we want to remove that fear so we get the benefit of the collective to get the impact for the change we want to see. And then finally, we're going to continue to listen, and we're going to use all of that listening as a leadership team to come together, refresh, revise, and continue to have uh, DNI plans that put us on path to receive and realize our employee North Star and become the best employer that we can. Can be. We have 135,000 V-teamers. When we add in their families, it's about a half a million people. And we know if we activate and create that environment inside the world that we do control, it will become infectious and it will in, in populate the community that's outside of our direct control. And we can be a light and an example to lead the change. Thanks. Thank you, Christy. And uh, I would like to sum it up by, first of all, this was all about sharing and listening. And, uh, and I have to thank this great panel for sharing their thoughts, where we are and what we can do more. But also thanking everyone that has joined us uh, listening to this, because it's uh, a two-way street. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm really pleased to see uh, the engagement we have around these topics. And we as V-teamers, this is important to us. Uh, I, I, there's so many things said, but just one thing that I have said so many times during this uh, pandemic is that this is the times when you reach out to V-teamers, colleagues, families, and ask, how are you doing? Uh, you have to do that. There are, there are so many things happening in all our lives that are so new and so different and so tough. Reach out. Wendy said it. She's talking to all our friends, reaching out and asking how they're doing. If they say they're OK, you ask again. That's what you need to do in these times to see that you are. And we have the tool, as also uh, Wendy said, we have the tool. It's the phone. We can communicate with everyone. And uh, I have my list of people that I need to talk to every week. I continue to do so. I just tell everyone to do the same. Um, you're summing up because it's an up to speed, and I always say the same things at up to speed. Remember, in this pandemic, our priorities have been clear. Number one, safe and healthy of our employees. Uh, the emergency operations center with Christy and Joe continue to, to work with all the uh, different leaders, if it's for the stores or for our front line, together with Kevin Service and Kyle and all the team. We continue to do that and get the right information out. We also are in the phase three of return to office. We got their information in the pulse yesterday. We need some more information around it. Christy and the team are working with that. We take that extremely important. Uh, Secondly, keep our customers and our networks up. And I, I cannot uh, thank more our IT department and our network department and Kyle and his whole team for seeing that we are continue to perform extremely well in our networks and supporting our customers in times like this when communication is vital. It's so critical for so many people uh, around the world and here in the United States. Secondly, uh, thirdly, 
doing uh, the support to our society. And I think you have seen what we have done with everything from pay it forward, what we did with donations. We continue to do that. We do it because it's part of our strategy. We do it because we have the four stakeholders uh, that is balancing our decisions every day, and we think about them long term. That's how we deal with everything from shareholders, employees, customers, and society. And remember what I talked yesterday? That's how we get it all together. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, uh, you're saying we are still here at the leadership forum, the virtual leadership forum that we have. And uh, uh, yesterday we talked a lot about businesses. We, of course, talked about this uh, uh, upcoming racist situation. But we also talked about business, customers. Uh, and, uh, and today we talk a little bit more about society, employees, and culture. So it all hangs together for us as a leadership. And uh, you, you're going to hear it as a VT feedback after the meeting is over, but uh, we continue to do as we've done since the beginning of this pandemic. We share everything with all the V-teamers constantly, so you feel updated. Continue to send us information. Continue to engage with us. Uh, that's the best way to continue to execute well in an environment that we are right now. So once again, thank you very much for tuning in. I, I hand it over to the host of the uh, Up to Speed Live, Mr. Jeremy. Hans, thank you so much, and thank you to our panel for uh, for sharing those those messages. I just got to tell you from from watching Twitter and some emails that come in from this, our employees are so very thankful for having this conversation. Uh, resources once we post the replay, replay is available right away on Twitter. But when we post it later on Inside Verizon, we're going to link out to some resources uh, for you for you to have those discussions with your family, your friends. Uh, a reminder of the things that we have, like Christy mentioned, uh, EAP and, and various other things, and employee resource groups, how important it is for us to connect with our, our teammates uh, around the world. Uh, don't forget, you know, we've uh, talked about criminal justice reform as well uh, with Craig Silliman in a past podcast. We'll, we'll put that link up. But to wrap it up, uh, Wendy said uh, change has to come, and, you know, a change is going to come, and it's going to take us all. So I appreciate you all joining. Talking about this today, we will continue this conversation. Uh, and we will be back with you again tomorrow. Until next time, you're up to speed.